All right. Moving right along here, Jesse, what do we got next? All right. Next up, we have a question from Joe and he's got a, he talks about little bets, a concept that you introduced in your book. Uh, so good. They can't ignore you. Hi, Cal. This is Joe from the Midwest. I wanted to thank you for answering my previous questions, especially the one about um, getting recognizing that we we're going through a year of a dumpster fire and to spend the summer really chiseling away at the deep work and get a marine stove while I do it. Um, didn't get the marine stove, but I did spend the summer working on the big project and it was it helps keeps me keep me sane. Um, my question is about little bets. You mentioned it's so good they can't ignore you that you allot time to pursue little bets and you test them out on your blog, a short little blog post, or you test them out in different ways. I'm wondering, as as you get deeper into your career, do you still allot a significant amount of time for these little bets? For me, I'm very fortunate that I got my first book deal. I'm working really hard on that project and a couple of other really big rocks for my career, but I don't really see short of Athena bursting out of my skull how I can allot specific time just to pursue little bets when these other looming deadlines and big projects need my attention now. So if you could spend some time talking about what role does little bets take as you get deeper into your career, I think it would really help. Thanks. Well, Joe, congratulations on the book deal. Uh, Shame, however, for not buying a marine pellet stove because that is critical that is critical to any deep work shed space. For people who don't remember this question, uh, it was Michael Pollan. When Michael Pollan built a writer shed in the woods behind his house in Kent, Connecticut, he heated it with a marine pellet stove. So it's, it's a, like a pellet burning stove you put on a boat. So it, it generates heat, but it's like small, you know, because it, it's mean just for heating a, a boat. And so you put a, a pellet, marine pellet stove in your teeny house and that's how you heat it while you look out over the snow-strewn fields and the snow-laden boughs of the birch trees in Kent, Connecticut, and have that warmth as you write in your, your uh, cabin, wood-lined cabin. That's the vision. So, yeah, you still need to buy that stove. I actually went, uh, I went out to Kent, Connecticut a few years ago and was doing a speaking gig out there. And, and it was like at a conference, like one of these conferences they used to do for uh, rich people basically. And the rich people come and then a bunch of speakers and writers come and give talks and stuff. And, and the, the speakers and writers come because they want to meet the other speakers and writers. And then the, uh, the rich people come because they want to, you know, hear from the speakers and writers. And it's kind of a weird thing, but kind of a cool thing. And it was in Kent, Connecticut. So Michael Pollan was there because he still kept that house in Kent, Connecticut. And uh, who else was there? Henry Kissinger was there because he turns out to have a house in Kent, Connecticut. He's very old now, but he was there as well. Um, but that was interesting. So that's when I learned like, oh, Pollen has the house here. And I can tell you, it's like a beautiful town. It has like this kind of fancy main street and then it's all hills and trees. And I get why people flee New York to, to move to Kent. And so that's my, that's my Kent, Connecticut story. Um, all right, but let's get back to Little Bets. So Little Bets was a, a concept I talked about and so good they can't ignore you. It was coined by, I believe the author's name was Sims. Maybe Phil Sims. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Do you have it, Jesse? You could look it up, right? Well, Phil Sims is definitely an NFL quarterback, so I was just saying well, He's an NFL that. quarterback who also writes about business strategy in his book, Little Bets. Is that, <laughs> all right, so probably not Phil Sims. Can you can you uh, do like a Joe Rogan, Jamie thing here and see if we can find out? Yeah. No, I feel bad. No, I feel bad that I'm using the the, <laughs> the wrong name. Anyways, I think the guy's name was Sims. I mean, I this is a decade ago I wrote this book. Uh, but it was a, a self-explanatory concept of in your career, in your business, what you want to try to do is take steps for which you can get feedback. And then you can see, and that can direct it. Oh, I get feedback. Like this isn't resonating. This is, so let me go that direction. Let me try a couple more bets. And by making uh, sequential bets and making your uh, future actions based on the feedback from those bets, you can actually have like an evidence-based way of guiding what you do. And this is better than he would argue uh coming up with a huge big plan in abstract and then like i'm gonna go execute this three-year plan you know and i hope it goes well so sims was saying take bets and get feedback john sims is it john sims that doesn't sound right okay. can you find is can you find the book little bets 
on. I'll look for it. Yeah, like Amazon or something like that. If it is Phil Sims, that'd be awesome. <laughs> if the if the quarterback <laughs> if the quarterback was writing <laughs> writing that book. Phil Sims is on Mad Dog every Friday. I love that spot. <laughs> okay, so Phil, Phil Phil Sims is on Mad Dog every Friday, talking <laughs> like Harvard Business Review style career strategy. Like Mad Dog, let me talk to you about getting feedback from the right market segments on your consulting firm. Um, so Joe, I mean, I think the key thing to take away from Little Bets is Peter Sims. Peter Sims, I was close. Yeah, yeah, Phil Peter. Peter Sims, little known fact, younger brother of NFL quarterback Phil Sims. <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put that out there. <laughs> just gonna declare that. Um, so the feedback's what's key. So Joe, the feedback's what's key, right? And so I'm thinking about your situation. Yeah, at some point, you're as you get feedback and you move along, you get to the place where the steps are pretty big. But if you're thinking about a book, you're writing a book now. But how did you come to write that book? Hopefully, there was a sequence of little bets where you were finding uh, these ideas, what resonates, what seems to have an audience. And so you have this clear feedback before you actually go to the stage of writing a book about it. I think that's a clear example. I mean, take something like my most recent book, A World Without Email. How many years can you go back and hear me talking about these things? I mean, you can go back and like my first appearance on the Ezra Klein podcast years ago. I'm working through a bunch of the core ideas that became a world without email, right? Years before. How many articles that I write? Uh, there's actually an article I wrote for the Harvard Business Review to promote deep work. So all the way back in 2016, that was about getting rid of email and working through some concepts that made their way into the book. So uh, years of I work out concepts and my little bets so are I write about them or I talk about them on this podcast or I talk about them on another podcast or I write articles about them and I see what the response is. So like I'm thinking now I might write a book about slow productivity. I've been testing out this, this idea. I wrote a New Yorker piece about it. Got some pretty good feedback. That was useful. I did a podcast video about this, a core idea video. That was useful. I talked about it on Tim Ferriss's podcast. And I could see uh, when he split up that interview into segments, he did a clip of the slow productivity discussion. And that's the most viewed clip of all the clips he did from the, the podcast. That's feedback on this. So those are little bets that are helping me put together what I want to do. And at some point, I'm going to write a book about it. So Joe, I would say that's the takeaway message is you want to get real feedback from people, not people like friends, but actual unbiased feedback. Are you buying this? Are you paying for this? Are you giving me money? And allow that to help direct you towards which direction you go. But I think you're absolutely right to point out that a little bet strategy will eventually lead you to really big things that take time. You do a lot of bets on, on topics, you might then spend end up spending two years writing a book. You do a little bunch of little bets on a product, you might end up at some point taking on investment and going all in on a business. And that's a multi-year commitment one way or the other. So that's true. Little bets lead to big commitments, but the key is not to jump right into that big commitment just because you hope or you have a reasonable story about why what you're going to do would be useful, that you actually have some evidence. And uh, if you doubt that, talk to NFL quarterback Phil Sims. He will fill your ear. <laughs> he will fill your ear with thoughts on, on little bets. All right, man, it's a blast for the past. So good they can't ignore you it was 2012. So yeah, we're at the 10 year 10 year anniversary. Interesting. Like that's when I kick off. Um, that's when I kicked off my writing career as a nonfiction idea book writer. I wrote these three books for students. That's how I got my sea legs. That's how I built up my craft. And So Good They Can't Ignore You was uh, the vision I had all along of, I want to write idea books, nonfiction books, table at Barnes and Noble, on NPR, you know, New York Times articles. Like that's what I wanted to do. And that's where I kicked off that transition. So it's like a really important book for me. It was the first time someone said, okay, you're, you're allowed to write a hardcover book about an idea. It's a crazy thing. Like just an idea you made up you know, and we're going to, you can just put that in a book and we'll, we'll see what happens. So that was definitely a big, big transition for me. That's a cool story. Yeah. Um, and it was good. That book went to auction. And at the time it seemed like a lot of money. It was, it's how we bought our first, you know, it was the down payment for our first house and how we bought our first car as we came out to Georgetown was because that book was really, I wrote it right before I came out here and it came out like right after I got here. It's my memory. My memory is right after I got to Georgetown, it came out, but I, I wrote it as a postdoc. And so it was exciting. Like it was some money and not like life-changing money, but like bigger, 
bigger by far, like factor of five bigger than I was getting for the student books or whatever. And then it didn't do well out of the gates, right? So there's a story in that. Like we, we, uh, there's a big push. We, we hired a, a good PR company and, um, you know, it just kind of disappeared. We're like, oh man, <laughs> I guess, you know, because I, I didn't know how publicity, I had no idea how book sales work. I don't, I still don't know how that works. And it's like, okay, I guess, uh, do I get to keep doing this? I don't know. And so I pitched them deep work finally. And they're like, yeah, but we're going to pay you less money. But if you want to write it, go ahead, you know? And it was just a funny thing. It's just, uh, good ideas are good ideas. And it took years, but then it just, it picked up and, uh, sold hundreds of thousands of copies. But like, it was, uh, it seemed like a dud out of the gate. And I'll say the two things that seemed to matter was podcasting came along about two years after I wrote that book. So I wrote that book. I, I did a thing for the New York Times and like it got a good, you know, there's a few things I did. It kind of disappeared. And it's some radio, but some stupid radio. Uh, and then starting around 2014, podcasting became a thing. And so I became, I was like a very early guest in podcasting circuits, doing a lot of these early podcasts. And and I just did a lot of podcasts. Like, why not? I thought it was fun. And um, I think that built the slow burn. If they're from like 2014 to 2016, I was on a lot of shows. And that's how I got kind of good at it because I was doing podcasting really early on and I sort of learned a medium. And I think that's what really two years after it came out started that burn. And then Deep Work did something similar, but its burn was much more intense. Like that, that book sold a lot of copies. And I think that also just pointed people back towards that original book. So that's how it all got started for me. I was got real excited, got this deal, got this book. It disappeared. Thought that I'd be done with publishing. And then podcasting came along and Deep Work came along. And that's actually like a, it turned out to be a very successful book. The other thing too that you talk about and others talk about is you have, you had another job too. So you weren't relying on that to survive. So, I mean, yeah. you could like give it some time. Yeah, exactly. I don't, it would have been harder if I was, well, what happened in the nonfiction space? Much more stressful. It's, and you have to become like a super speaker. That's what was happening back then. If you're trying to make a living off of nonfiction advice books, you had to be doing 30 to 50 speeches a year. You know, and like what a lot of writers would do in that space, and it's it's very lucrative, by the way, but it's it's tough. But Try a lot a, a, a lot of writers would just do year on year off, so like fifty speeches, killer, and then a year writing, and then fifty speeches a year writing, and you always had to have the book came out, and then your then your your whole life is built around the speaking. So fortunately, I was a professor, and so I didn't have to do that. You know, I could just say I don't know. I guess this book didn't do well, and I waited a long time. That book came out in two thousand and twelve, and then I didn't. Deep work came out four years later. So I was having kids and trying to get tenure, you know? And so that was kind of a fun time, actually. I mean, there's something innocent to it. I would do, it was entirely homegrown. That's the way I remember it is like, I would do podcast, uh, in my basement and that was it. And then at some point I started writing deep work just sort of on my own and that was it. Right. And then it, everything else was just organic. And so that's my view. If like, if, if a book is right, it will eventually sell a lot of copies, um, regardless of what happens early on. I, I don't know how to make a book sell a lot of copies right up front. I've never been able to do that. I, I it's kind of like what the book says. It's so good you can't ignore you. So yeah. if like, the book is good, it can't be ignored. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anyone knows. Like my editor, I love the editor on that book. He's like, this is a great idea. Like this, And he was right in the end. We sold a ton of copies of that book. And he, but he was like baffled. He's like, why aren't we early on? Why is, why is no one buying this? It's such, I just don't think people understand. Or they don't understand the degree to which like email lists, and these other type of dynamics and cultural, your cultural awareness, like this stuff plays a huge role in, in things like taking off right out of the back. Um, but it's almost like that's orthogonal from whether or not the book is going to be. So we'll see, we'll see, but it, it's a cool story. So that, that started that whole chapter of my life, which was, that was an interesting one.